Welcome to my channel, I'm Gary Uriawan and today we're going to talk about landscape photography using micro four thirds camera. Let's go! Before we continue with this video, this is just a quick reminder for you to support my channel by liking this video, sharing this video, and subscribing to my channel down below. Thank you, let's continue with the video. So before we dive in any further, I just want to talk a little bit about what landscape photography is in my opinion. Basically in my own interpretation, the landscape photography is an act of photographing the nature. It doesn't always have to be in a totally natural kind of environment, so sometimes a little bit of man-made elements in the image is fine. So the main goal of landscape photography is to trigger a sense of being there for the viewer. The photograph must be able to take the viewer's mind and imagination and make him or her feel what you feel during photographing the landscape photograph in that location. This kind of feeling will definitely make the heart and emotion of the viewer to move and the viewer will definitely appreciate the amazing view that they see in your photograph. Basically, there are already lots of landscape photography video in YouTube and my favorite ones are from Elia Lacardi, from Thomas Heaton, the F Stoppers and so many more. Certainly, I'm not a professional landscape photographer and I don't intend to be one. So this is all just subjective and based on my opinions and experience. But I am sure that this video will help you to understand more about landscape photography and develop more appreciation towards landscape photography in general. So now let's talk about the before phase of landscape photography which is the preparation. Before you're able to start capturing a stunning landscape photography, you definitely need to prepare a few important things. First, you need to study the location. When I know that that I have a chance to photograph a stunning landscape somewhere, the first thing that I do is head to the internet. I will then take a look at some of the images that's already been captured in the internet of that place that I'm about to photograph so that I have a general idea about what I'm going to photograph. I will also study the location in Google Maps just trying to get an idea of what the location is going to be like. I will also check the surrounding of the location trying to find other spots that might be more interesting than the original spot that I saw from the other photographs. Other thing that you need to check is the weather. How's the weather gonna be when you're gonna visit that location during that time of the year? Is it gonna be cloudy? Is it gonna be sunny? Or is it gonna be raining? I understand that sometimes you don't have too much choice when it comes to weather. You might be traveling and you'll only visit that place only for an hour or two hours maximum during your travel. However, you can still plan accordingly. Try to make the most out of your window of opportunity. And if it is possible, try to avoid shooting during the work first time of the day which is during noon where the sun is directly above everything and it creates lighting that's very harsh for the landscape photography. I will try to make time to shoot during the morning or afternoon or even better during sunrise or sunset when the lighting is most dramatic. Alright so we've already talked about the preparation before we even depart to the location so now it's time to talk about the preparation when you arrive in the location. Make sure that you are not visiting during the busiest hour of that location. Many best landscape photography spots are always packed with tourists and people during its busiest hour. When you arrive at the location, first thing that you want to do is to scout every corner on that location to make sure that you have the best spot, your best vantage point to get the best image. Be sure to plan to shoot from different vantage points as well so that you can get different images from different point of view. Now that we've talked about preparation, now it's time to talk about the process of capturing landscape photography. First, after we study the location, we first need to decide which lens to use. This is due to the fact that the focal length really matters and it will dictate the aesthetic of the end result. In my other videos where I suggest lenses, I will suggest lens that have versatile focal length so that you can use it in so many different ways. However, for landscape photography, you will need three different kind of lenses that I think are crucial for landscape photography. An ultra wide angle lens, a normal focal length lens, and a telephoto lens. For most of my landscape photography, photographs, I usually take it with ultra wide angle lenses simply because I just love how the perspective of the image looks using an ultra wide angle lens. But you don't have to use ultra wide angle lens all of the time. Sometimes using a normal angle lens or a telephoto lens will give you a more interesting result. As a suggestion, try
try to experiment with different perspective and different compression using different focal length of lenses. An ultra wide angle lens will push things away but it will include more things in the frame. However, if you're using a telephoto lens, it will pull things closer to you but you get tighter framing. Be mindful though because we're talking about landscape photography, generally we want everything to be in focus and clear. That means we need to stop down our aperture to get more depth of field. This is the reason why I love to use wide angle lenses for landscape photography because basically the wider the focal length is, the more depth of field you get even with large aperture such as with my lens Laowa 7.5mm f2. Now let's briefly talk about the subject of composition. I'm a firm believer that when it comes to composition, it is better to be straightforward and keep it simple so that it doesn't make the image to become more sophisticated than what it is and takes away the emotion and the feeling for the viewer. So that means usually when it comes to composition, I will rely on rule of thirds or just try to put the point of interest at the center of the image. Another huge component when it comes to composition is layering. What I mean by that is try to compose the image by employing foreground, midground, and background layers. Layers. With a good use of layering technique, you'll be able to create a 3D kind of feel which will enhance the feeling of being there for your viewer. Your background can be the sky, the clouds, or something far away. Your midground can be the main scenery that you want your viewer to enjoy such as the lake, the sea, the island, the mountain, or the forest, or something like that. And your foreground can be something simple that can enhance the overall scenery such as a rock, or maybe a flower, a tree a push or something that is close to you. Generally, I would love to use my foreground as a point of interest as well, something to anchor for the viewer's eye. Speaking of point of interest, make sure that you always have at least one. You want a point of interest that will grab your viewer's attention so that they don't just wander the image aimlessly and then later on become uninterested with your image. Having a good point of interest not will just anchor your viewer's eye to the image but it will also enhance the aesthetic element of the image and it will make your image look good. However, you also don't want to have too much point of interest in your image because it will become distracting for your viewer. Limit to just one or two or three point of interest at maximum. Speaking of distraction, this is the next point during the process of shooting landscape photography which is to avoid distraction in your image. Cables, poles, fences, garbage, trash can will hurt the visual aesthetic of your image. So avoid all these distractions at all costs. So there are few ways that you can do to avoid distractions in your image. First, you can adjust your framing so that those distracting elements won't appear in your framing. Or if it's possible, try to remove those garbage before you take the picture. If it's not possible, then try to edit those distractions during post-processing using software. All of the methods are fine. Use we prefer to just frame the image or remove the garbage but sometimes it's not possible so sometimes removing the distraction using software is acceptable. Landscape photography is about art, emotion, expression. It's not about photojournalistic documentation so it's okay to edit your image. Last point to keep in mind when you're taking landscape photography is also try to play around with the camera angle. Make sure that you try to experiment with different kinds of camera angle low angle, eye level, or high angle. Changing the camera angle will result in different kind of emotion and feel on your image. So there's none that is better than the other. Make sure that you try to experiment and find the best one for your image. Now let's briefly talk about the subject of camera setting. Landscape photography in general isn't too complicated when it comes to camera setting. However, in my experience, there are few basic settings that you need to understand in order to be able to maximize your landscape photography. First setting is ISO. You need to use ISO as low as possible. It's not just for landscape photography but also for other photography genres in general. Next setting is aperture. As I mentioned earlier, it is better for you to stop down so that you can have everything in focus which is better for landscape photography. So that means stopping down to about f8 or f11 when you're using a full frame camera. But since I'm using micro photos camera, I don't have to stop down too far. I can just go to about f4 or f5.6 which is equivalent to about 
f8 or f11 in full frame however there are times such as when in low light when you need to have a larger aperture such as f2.8 or f2 which is fine as long as you use hyperfocal distance to get everything in focus between your focus point to infinity next setting is shutter speed there are two kinds of shutter speed that will be useful for landscape photography first shutter speed that you want to use in landscape photography is fast shutter speed about 100 of a second or even faster than that and that shutter speed is very useful when you want to freeze any kind of movement in your image or if you want to make sure that everything looks tech sharp and there's nothing moving around such as leaves that are being blown by wind or maybe waterfall or something similar next shutter speed that you want to use for landscape photography is slow shutter speed about one second or even slower and this shutter speed is very useful when you want to enhance the sense of movement in your image such as when you're photographing waterfall or moving water or grass or leaves that are being blown by wind choose the shutter speed according to what you think is best for the image there's no right there's no wrong your job is to make sure that the shutter speed is appropriate and will enhance the overall feel of the image and will make the viewer feel what you feel when you are in the location next you will combine ISO aperture and shutter speed together into exposure and I think when it comes to exposure in landscape photography it's best to think of an exposure as being balanced not too bright not too dark just perfect however you need to be careful with exposure when it comes to landscape photography because if your exposure is a little bit too bright and the sky is getting blown out you cannot really recover that so in that sense landscape photography is one of a photography genre that is very demanding when it comes to dynamic range for your camera so if you are struggling with your camera's dynamic range or if you constantly get dark foreground with very bright background that you always kind of struggle with i think there are a few things that you can do to compensate for the lack of dynamic range in your camera first solution to enhance your camera dynamic range is to use graduated nd filter like this ones so basically what a graduated nd filter is is a filter that is graduated from dark to clear which is uh, very useful when you shoot in a backlight situation so if you ever encounter a backlight situation or something like that all you need to do is just to install the graduated ND filter in front of your lens and make sure that the top dark part of the uh, graduated ND filter is aligned properly to your lens so that it will cover the overly bright sky on your image by doing that the graduated ND filter will compensate for the overly bright sky and make it a little bit darker so that the dynamic range of your camera won't have to work too hard other thing that you can do to compensate for the lack of dynamic range in your camera is to shoot raw RAW is a picture format where basically the camera will save all the important dynamic range data as well as color data so that when it comes to post processing your image you will have the flexibility to extract as much dynamic range and color as you can if you are interested to learn more about how to shoot RAW I have a whole video dedicated about shooting RAW using micro four thirds camera check it in the link on the description below there are other tips and tools that I want to share to you that can improve landscape photography as well first sometimes you also want to use a polarizer filter polarizer filter will cut down on glares especially on shiny objects such as water so it is very useful when you're shooting an image with water in it such as a pond a lake or something like that by cutting down glare on water then you'll be able to get a clearer looking water on your image using polarizer filter there's a misunderstanding when it comes to polarizer filter many people say that you have have to use polarizer filter on your lens so that it can punch the contrast and create more saturation on your image but I find that it's not true you can simply imitate that effect using post-processing softwares however when it comes to the glaring cutting effect of a polarizer filter it cannot be imitated using any kind of software other landscape photography tip if you forgot to bring your wide angle lens when you're shooting landscape photography you can imitate your wide angle lens using a normal lens and then shooting in panorama mode in your camera 
I've done quite a few panorama shots myself, but I still prefer to use a real wide angle lens simply because it's much simpler to use and it's easier and it's quicker. Other tip, this is regarding dynamic range again. So if you wanna get more dynamic range without the help of additional tool, you can do exposure bracketing. Basically, you will shoot multiple images of different exposures from dark to bright and then you will combine them together in post-processing to extract more dynamic range. Of course, you will be shooting the same frame, so you will have to use a tripod. And that leads to my last tip for landscape photography, which is to always bring a tripod. A tripod will help you to do exposure bracketing like what I just mentioned, but it will also help you to give you a steady platform when you're doing slow shutter speed photography. Alright, now that we've covered all the process when it comes to landscape photography, now it's time to talk about post-processing. So as I mentioned earlier, I always prefer to shoot raw when it comes to landscape photography. So post-processing is a required process that is crucial for getting the final result that I want for landscape photography. My preferred software for post-processing landscape photography is Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop in my PC. Not because they are the best, but they are the only softwares that I know how to use. So first step in post-processing is to extract dynamic range. What I mean by that is to adjust shadow and highlight until the image looks very balanced, not too dark, not too bright on all parts of the image. However, please don't overdo the shadow and highlight adjustment because if you overdo both of these settings, it will make the image look bizarre and weird and surreal and fake. In addition to using the shadow and highlight adjustment in Lightroom or Adobe, Adobe Photoshop Camera Raw, you can also use graduated filter in those softwares to further enhance the shadow and highlight with more details and control. You can be very creative when you are using graduated filters because then you can also adjust the color or other detailed settings that you might not be able to find in using just the shadow and highlight adjustment. Next step is to adjust contrast. It is important to bring back some contrast after we adjust the dynamic range to avoid the image looking pale and lifeless. Still in the top Topic of dynamic range, if you previously use uh, exposure bracketing technique, you can use Auto HDR in Photoshop or Lightroom to extract even more dynamic range. This will allow you to get even more dramatic shadow and highlight adjustment that you cannot achieve with just using a single raw file. Alternatively, if you want more precise control of your HDR, you can use manual HDR in Photoshop by blending the exposures as layers. And what you do is you brush the appropriate exposure on parts of the image that you want. Next, you want to get some finishing touch on the Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop by just adding a little bit of clarity and a little bit of dehaze just to make the image pop, not too much, not to overdo it. Also feel free to slightly sharpen the image and reduce the noise a little bit when you're doing that. Next step is to remove the distracting part of the image such as trash can, poles, garbage, dust, dirt, or something like that. Really take the time and make sure that the image is clean. This is a very important process on the post-processing that you don't want to skip. Next step is to get more sharpness using high pass filter in Photoshop. Basically, you'll do it in Photoshop. And what you do is basically you duplicate the layer and then you apply some high pass filter on that duplicated layer and later on blend it back using overlay. And what you get in return is an enhanced micro contrast sharpness in your image. And now you're finished, congratulations. You got a stunning landscape photography. Please make sure to check once again for all the details in the image. Make sure there's no distracting element on the image. Everything is clean, everything is good looking, and the exposure is properly balanced and not looking pale or ugly. So now that we've talked about the preparation, the process, and post-processing, now it's time to talk about gear. First of all, gear does not matter. I've seen people taking landscape photographs using phones, using a crippled DSLR, using film cameras, GoPros, all sorts of stuff are being used to take landscape photographs. So yeah, landscape photography isn't just about the gear, but it's also about the photographer, the preparation, the process, the post-processing, and the end result itself. Once again, your job is to make your viewer have that same amazement that you have when you're taking the picture on location, be able to feel what you feel. That's it, I wanna share a little bit about the gear that I use to capture landscape photography in my experience. My main landscape camera was my already sold Panasonic GX7 which is 
at this time will be about 6 years old. Besides the GX7, I also use Olympus EPL6 which I already sold too. Now my landscape camera will be this Panasonic G85 that's recording this video right now or my 5 years old Panasonic GX8 which I love so much. All the cameras that I previously mentioned are micro four thirds and they are really great for capturing landscape photography. People always say full frame this, full frame that, high megapixel this, high megapixel that, medium format this, medium format that, but no, the truth is you don't always need those kind of cameras. I really think that my micro four thirds cameras are more than good enough for what I need for landscape photography. Well, I mentioned earlier that you need three types of lenses a wide angle lens a normal angle lens and a telephoto lens so now let me share my lenses that I usually use for landscape photography for my ultra wide angle lens for landscape photography without a doubt my favorite ultra wide angle lens is the Lawa 7.5 mm f2 this guy right here this lens is plenty wide for me at 7.5 mm or about 15 mm in full frame it is sharp small lightweight and also it has large aperture f2 the price of this lens is also not too expensive which is i'm really grateful for and the only drawback of this lens is that it cannot zoom and it's a manual focus lens so you need to learn how to use manual focus which in my opinion is not too difficult other wide angle lens that i use is the olympus 9 to 18 mm which I also love and I also have. And my other favorite wide angle lens as well is the Panasonic 7 to 14 mm f4, which I don't already have because I sold it, but I also love it because it's wide, it's zoom, and it's not too expensive. Next for my normal lens, my favorite lens is the Panasonic 12 to 35 mm, which is recording this video right now. The Panasonic 12 to 35 mm has a large aperture of f2.8 and it covers the Lawa's wide angle perfectly because it has normal angle from 12 to 35 millimeter which is about 24 to 70 millimeter in full frame so it's very useful and versatile next my favorite telephoto lens is the Panasonic 14 to 140 millimeter f35 to f5.6 this lens technically is not just a telephoto lens it's a super zoom lens so it can also be used as a normal lens and the good thing about this lens is that from 14 all the way to 140 and in between all the focal lengths are sharp enough for my needs although they are not the sharpest this lens is very flexible and easy to use and it negates the need to bring multiple lenses at once other great telephoto lens for landscape is the Panasonic 35 to 100 mm either the f2.8 version that I have right here which has a large aperture of f2.8 or the smaller version f4 to f5.6 which is very small compact lightweight and as sharp all right so we've talked about all the aspects about landscape photography that I I have in my own personal perspective. I hope that after you're watching this video, you have more insight and idea about my perspective about landscape photography, as well as more appreciation toward this genre of photography, as well as the photographers themselves. Remember, it's not just about the end result when it comes to landscape photography. It is also about the preparation, the process, and the post-processing, and enjoying every part of the process as well. So that is all for today's video. I hope that you find this video to be useful please comment down below if you have any question about landscape photography in general or if you want to share something about your experience of shooting landscape photography also don't forget to support my channel by liking this video sharing this video and subscribing to my channel down below thank you and goodbye